morning, good morning. It's happy to see such a happy bunch today. I mean, I know you're always pretty cheerful, but I love seeing all the conversations and the hugs. Well, you might have noticed Ty and I are sporting our Camp Pondo t-shirts this morning and a lot of our uh, junior high students and staff because we got to go to Camp Pondo last week and our high school students are there now and they are getting ready to have their final service before they head down the mountain and just amazing reports of all that God is doing up there and a lot of fun stuff. So we're excited about that. I'm not sure though if we love You know, if it's a matter of that we love Camp Pondo so much or just we really appreciate the fact that they have $5 discount bins (laughs) that we love to raid, I'm I'm pretty sure it's a little bit of both. But I'm really happy to be here this morning. I'm happy to jump in on this series. If you've been with us or if you haven't been with us, we are actually in week three of our I See You Through Jesus' Eyes series. And I would say that... I. This idea of sight and our theme for the year, Vision 2020, has really taken on significant meaning for me now that I'm in my mid-40s and I had to buy these. (laughs) Actually, I ended up buying three pairs of these and this turns out to not be enough (laughs) and I will explain why. So it started when all of a sudden I realized I can't drive after the sun goes down, or at least not safely or confidently. But it's like all of a sudden the sun goes down and I'm like, what, what's going on? Like, why are there so many lights? And how come they look so fuzzy? And why am I getting so tired? And then my kids said, mom, why are you looking at your phone like that? And I'm like, I don't know, I think it's broken. I can't figure out what's wrong with it. So I begrudgingly went to the eye doctor and he gave me two prescriptions, one for driving at night. Now when I drive and I, well, halfway through my drive, I remember, oh, I have glasses that help this. But now when I drive, I put my glasses on, I'm like, oh, that fuzzy green thing, that's a nice circular green light. (laughs) That's amazing. And then I got readers. And so I thought, you know, I've never done glasses before, but I'm going to do this really good. I'm going to get two pairs of readers. I'm going to get one for my nightstand, and then I'm going to get one to keep in my purse. So everywhere I go, I have glasses. Well, then now being back into school, I have a backpack. So I put my readers from my purse into my backpack. And last week I'm sitting in the office and I'm like, I can't see a thing. (laughs) I don't know what's happening. So I put the book down, I was reading and I just used the computer because you can stretch the font and make it big. So I think I'm gonna have to get a third pair of those. But how many of you know that you can see something without really seeing it? You can see something without really truly seeing it. How true is this quote? Eyes that look are common. Eyes that see are rare. See, there's a difference between looking and seeing. We can look at someone or something or a situation and we can look to find what we were looking for. But seeing is noticing it for what it really is. And so today, we're gonna look, our our passage that we're gonna read, we're gonna discover that not only does Jesus want us to see, but he wants us to see greater things. He wants us to see with greater clarity, from a greater perspective. So turn with me, if you will, to John chapter one, verse 43. And we're going to take a look at this passage, a passage that Pastor Fraser, um, he started us off and then he mentioned just a little bit at the end of his message last night, but we're going to look at this invitation to come and see and to see with more clarity. So if you could put your one hand on your Bible and one hand on your heart and let's say this prayer together. Father God, God. open my heart heart. to receive your word today. And then one hand on your head, Holy Spirit, Spirit. open my mind mind. to receive your truth today. And then extend a hand to a neighbor, Jesus, Jesus. bless my neighbor, neighbor. 
to live at your commands today. So we're going to start in John 1, verse 43. I'm going to use my glasses. Uh, thank you. The next day, Jesus decided to go. If you want to know what happened the day before, you could either read ahead or you could listen to Pastor Fraser's message from last week. It says, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Essentially saying, we found the one we've been waiting for. Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I grew up in one of those towns, so I get it. <laughs> Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? you will see greater things than these. Now, I have to admit to you, I discovered something about myself while reading this passage, a passage I have read a bunch of times before. But what I discovered is that sometimes I read the Bible through a very sarcastic tone. Because I have read this statement, do you believe because I said I saw you under a fig tree? But I read it like, you believe because I saw you under a fig tree? you're gonna see greater things than that. Jesus doesn't talk like that. But in my mind, it's like, you believe that? But Jesus, I think, is sincerely excited that Nathaniel is beginning to see something clearly, and Jesus is like, hold on to your hat. There's so much more. Now, I think we would all say, I, I wanna see greater things. I wanna have bigger vision, a, a better perspective. I wanna have more clarity. But how many of you know that, man, we can get bogged down in the things of life, right? The day-to-day -day things, the, the things that we have to do, maybe the seemingly mundane things. Of, we just have to take care of things. It's like, oh, I wish I could live always in the mindset of thinking about the greater and bigger things. If we're not careful, we can get so caught up with rights and what's right in front of our faces. We call this not being able to see the forest from the trees. That means that we're so focused on the little things that we don't get to see the bigger picture or the bigger perspective. And this can happen at work and this can happen in our relationships. But I will admit that this, I saw this most challenging in my life, parenting little ones. So parenting little ones was such a challenge for me. I mean, I think it's a challenge for all of us, but it's a challenge particularly for my personality because I'm what they call type A, which doesn't stand for Amber. It stands for absolutely concerned about time and efficiency, okay? And if you're thinking, yep, that's her, um, I've been working on this for 10 years. <laughs> so I'm actually doing a little bit better than I used to be. Catch me when I'm 90, I'm gonna be so chill. <laughs> but this was really challenging for me because I found myself doing things I never expected to have to do. Like you're tasked with teaching a tiny human how to go pee pee in the potty. And then you're saying things like going pee-pee in the potty in public, right? And, and then here you are, you're having to, you know, I had to set aside large chunks of life and time to try to teach this child to use the restroom in an appropriate place. And then you're sitting there and you're just like waiting. And I know I had to dance, I had to sing, I had to bribe, I had to do all kinds of things to try to get this to happen. And then sure enough, when both of you get frustrated and you give up, it takes that child all of 13 seconds to go in their clothes once you put them back on them, right? So frustrating. And then the worst, the absolute worst for me was the tying the shoe phase. 
because you've got to leave the house. Inevitably, you're running late because you have said beautiful children. And you don't think like first thing in the morning is we should start tying our shoes because it's going to take us several hours, right? You just think, okay, I got everything together. I got the bags packed. We're ready. Okay, I got my keys. Here we go. Oh, they have to tie their shoes. And they have to tie their shoes. Like it's important that they learn how to tie their shoes. And even if you know, whether you have a strong-willed, independent child that you know, wants to tie their shoe, or you have the type of child that really doesn't ever want to do anything for themselves, either way, these children need to be taught how to tie their shoes. And this is what your life ends up looking like. Point your eyes to the screen. on her Instagram story and I text her and I'm like, I need all of those videos. I have like 37 sermon illustrations that I can use that for. Now as auntie, I wanna step in and help the little guy. It's like, oh man. But as mom, it was, I, I was losing my mind. Now, not on the outside, well, not on the outside, all the time because you have to be calm and you have to be encouraging but inside I'm like I am going to be late to my own funeral like what is happening right now and I remember you guys I'm not, there's no joke I remember crying usually in the bathroom but I remember crying saying God this cannot be the reason you put me on the planet <laughs> but that is seeing the trees Seeing the forest through the trees is recognizing what an unbelievable privilege it is to be able to say to someone, you can try hard things. I know this seems tough. I know that this is even scary, but you get to create an environment where you get to instill confidence and you get to say, I'm gonna be here through the hard times. That you're gonna try and you're gonna struggle and you're gonna succeed beyond anything you thought you were capable of. And you're gonna try and you're gonna struggle and you're gonna fail in ways you never imagined, but you are loved and you are accepted and you are seen. See, we can see trees and we can see the forest, but looking through the eyes of Jesus is recognizing that he sees the forest and the trees that he recognizes that there is no forest without the trees. Every part of the perspective is important. But again, if we're only looking for what we find, then we aren't giving ourselves the opportunity to truly notice what is. It's like this picture, this picture of a gentleman. I skipped it early, earlier, Norma, we can go ahead and show that. You can look quickly and just see a man, but if you look more closely, more intently, you see it from a completely different perspective. Again, I think looking through the eyes of Jesus recognize, is recognizing that every piece of the perspective is important. And if we get stuck on just noticing the trees, we miss the bigger picture, the greater things that he is wanting us to see. But when we are also only focused on how do I get past these trees, we miss how significant each one is. So pull out your sermon notes with me. See, Jesus recognized that Nathaniel needed to know he was seen before he could truly see. So number one is people need to be seen in order 
to see. See, the Apostle Paul, when he was still called Saul, in all of his knowledge and activity, he wasn't able to see Jesus until he knew that Jesus saw him when he was encountered by Jesus on the road to Damascus and he knew that Jesus saw him and called him by name, it was then and only then was he able to see Jesus. I mean, technically he was blinded for a little bit, but he could see him with his heart and with his mind in a way that his natural sight had never brought him clarity. He was seen by Jesus. So Nathaniel, you know, he was a skeptic. He was a good-hearted man trying his best to do all the right things, really in the sincerity of his heart, but he was skeptical. Someone from Nazareth, really? But when he realized that Jesus saw him in the little things, sitting under a fig tree, now scholars say, you know, he could have been you know, really thinking, contemplating. He, he could have been praying. He could have, that could have been where he was spending his time and even asking God for the Messiah. We don't know for sure. He could have been taking a nap. I don't know. But Philip came and he said, come and see. And all we know for sure is that Jesus could see him under the fig tree. Jesus could see him in his activity William Barclay is a Scottish professor of divinity, which is Bible stuff, and an author. He wrote this about Nathaniel. It was not so much that Jesus had seen him under the fig tree that surprised Nathaniel. It was the fact that Jesus had read the thoughts of his inmost heart. Nathaniel said to himself, here is the man who understands my dreams. Here is the man who knows my prayers. Here is the man who has seen into my most intimate and secret longings. Longings which I have never ever dared to put into words. Here is the man who can translate the inarticulate sigh of my soul. That's our Jesus. And then he says to himself, after knowing that he is seen in that way, says, this must be God's promised anointed one and no other. See, once Nathaniel realized that Jesus could see him, he could then see Jesus for who he really was. And he said, Rabbi, teacher, you are the son of God. With confidence, exclamation point, you are the king of Israel. I have now come to believe that with great delight and no hint of sarcasm that Jesus said, Nathaniel, now that you can see the tree clearly, I have an entire forest I can't wait for you to see. Now sometimes we have to learn to see the forest from the trees and sometimes we have to see the forest from an actual tree like our youth leader Tyler Roth last week at camp. What happens at church camp almost never stays at church camp. I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. But seeing through the eyes of Jesus means I recognize that people must know they are seen before they have the ability to truly see. But once I recognize this, then I recognize my responsibility in the seeing. As a follower of Jesus, as a disciple, as one who is learning to be like him, I have a responsibility in this scene. Number two, we're gonna fill it in there. It is my, capital M-I, responsibility to invite people to be seen by Jesus so they can see Jesus. Let's say this together. It is my responsibility to invite people to be seen by Jesus so they can see Jesus. One more time, say it like you mean it. It is my responsibility to invite people to be seen by Jesus so they can see Jesus. See, in verse 48, Nathanael asked, where did you get to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. See, Jesus saw him there before Philip called him. 
He saw him sitting there. He probably knew exactly what he was thinking about or what he was praying. Jesus probably even knew that Nathaniel was gonna come to know him and come to see him in a different way. So if he knew that and he saw him there, why didn't Jesus just go over there and talk to him himself? Why did he wait for Philip to come and invite him? I think it's because Jesus was giving Philip the opportunity to see the greater things and to do the greater things. Philip, his brand new disciple, his, you know, follow me, he, just, just a few verses earlier, and here he is. He, he could have kept himself busy with a lot of activities. He could have been doing religious things. He could have been serving. He could do a lot of things, but he went straight to Nathaniel and invited him. And I think Jesus, not that he would have wanted Nathaniel to have just been left there, but I think that there is something so deeply within the heart of God that wants to see his people participate in his great big plan for humanity. See, in Genesis, it started off with he created us and he gave us the ability to rule and have dominion over all creation. And then the end of the story in Revelation, we will rule and reign with Jesus. But we have to recognize the significance of this middle part. This middle part where we are learning what it means to be kingdom agents. Where we are learning what the kingdom of God is like. Where we're learning what our authority and our place is. And where we're learning how it is that we live this out. Philip could have ignored that part, but instead he reached out to Nathaniel and invited him. And because he invited him, Nathaniel got to be seen and got to the ability to see. It's important that we learn to step into our authority in this middle season, but it's also important that we learn to take hold of our responsibility. It is my responsibility to invite people. It is Jesus's responsibility, it's Holy Spirit's responsibility to open the eyes and and to see into the person. But it is my responsibility to invite to that encounter. How sad would it have been if Philip just went on his way doing the following Jesus things and left his buddy sitting under a fig tree. Last week when Pastor Fraser talked about the seeing greater things in this passage and the doing greater things that Jesus talks about later in John 14, it's this idea of, you know, you need to see the greater things so you can do the greater things. And it's not the greater in quality, it's the greater in quantity and and capacity here and our opportunity, however many days that God has given us, we have the opportunity to see and do the things that are on the heart of Jesus to be done. I don't wanna miss that opportunity. We have to take both our place of authority, but also take up our responsibility. We have these friends that we love dearly, but they don't yet know Jesus. They um, have grown up in different various faiths as little kids and as basically junior hires decided that wasn't for me. And now they're grown and they're married and they just started their family. and. You know, we spend time with them intentionally. One, we just think they're super fun people. And two, because it's on our heart to see them come to know Jesus. They're two incredible people. And it breaks my heart that they don't yet know how much Jesus loves them, that they still believe that religion is just this thing you do, you're forced to do as a little kid. And they don't know how God has uniquely designed them. So we spend a lot of time with them. And I've been, you know, I I will say one of them I've known for 15, 20 years, and it's only in the last couple years that I've been truly intentional about praying for them, and, and that breaks my heart. But I'm taking the opportunity now that God opened my eyes. And so I've been praying for them and spending time with them, and they started their family, so they've got a little one, and now they're having the tough conversations of, well, what do we believe? What kind of hope are we gonna offer? 
this little one. Like, we got to get on the same page here. Is there something we believe in? And, and you know that anxiety in your heart of, I, I'm going to have to send this kid out into the world at some point. You're like, I'm just going to strap them to me <laughs> until they're 40. And, you know, but so that we can't do that. And so we're having dinner a couple weeks ago, and they're, they're, they're telling us about all these conversations that we're having. And, you know, I'm playing it cool. I'm just kind of, oh, yeah, so what did you guys come up with? And, you know, what are you thinking about? And they ask us questions about parenting, and I just, well, this is why we do what we do, and mostly it's a miracle. Um, but, you know, having a great conversation. So we, we're driving home that night, and I'm just like, oh, come on, Jesus. They're so close. Just push them into the end zone. We're like at the two-yard line. And I'm just like, come on, you can do it. And all of a sudden, Jesus just dropped this picture in my mind, and I could see the husband doing his kingdom work. I could see what God created him to do that there's an opportunity waiting for him, that once he comes to know who Jesus is and how Jesus sees him, there's a job for him to do. And I was so struck by that. Not, not that I didn't think God had a plan. I mean, if he had sat there that night at dinner and said, do you think God had a plan for my life? I'd be like, absolutely. But with such clarity, I saw what he would do. And all of a sudden I realized, Yes, I should be praying for them to come to know Jesus, but thinking with a greater perspective, thinking of the greater things rec is recognizing that Jesus already sees them in relationship with him and thriving in their kingdom purpose. And when I realized that that's how Jesus saw them, all of a sudden my, my, my vision and perspective of Jesus just magnified. Like, God, you are so good. You're not even on their radar. And you're honing in on exactly the way that you have created them. When I got to see through Jesus's eyes, I saw Jesus differently and I saw them differently. If we are not compelled to tell anyone about Jesus, I think we have to ask ourselves, then do I really see Jesus? Am I just looking at him for what I'm hoping to find? Or am I seeing him for who he really is? Am I seeing the way that he sees? Philip saw Jesus and saw him in a way that he knew he was the one they had been waiting for, and it compelled him to tell Nathaniel. Now you can say, well, Philip knew Nathaniel had been waiting for him. I mean, he was, you know, a devout Jew, and so he was actually waiting for the Messiah. And my friends and family and coworkers, like, I don't think they're waiting for Jesus. I get that argument. But also, if we're not seeing the desperate search the longing to be accepted, the longing to be loved, the longing to have hope and meaning. If we are not seeing the reality of their need for Jesus, then I'm afraid we're not seeing the one who is the answer to that need. We're not truly seeing the one clearly who came to be the provision for all that they could ever need. So the question is, are you living a come and see life? Are you living in a way in your day-to-day -day activities, in the, in the seemingly mundane things, are you living with the perspective that this has a greater meaning, a greater significance, that God sees this moment or this really long moment and he has greater things that will be birthed out of this moment, that it is not an isolated thing or I'm not alone in this situation, that God sees both the forest and the trees. Is that the perspective in which you are seeing things? If not, then what needs to change? What about your sight? needs to be different. Do you need to see Jesus more clearly? Do you need to see others more clearly the way that Jesus sees them? Do you need to see your situation or your circumstance a little more clearly? The solution to all of these is to come and see. 
come and see Jesus and allow him to give you the sight to see through his eyes the greater things. Does that sound good? He's not hiding. He's accessible and available for you and for me. He's got all the time in the world for you, but he longs for you to come into this understanding today. And we're gonna move into our time of baptism and I'm gonna invite Pastor Mark up and, and, and I couldn't think of a better way. I didn't necessarily plan this, but I thought, oh Jesus, that's awesome. We're gonna do baptism right now because what a beautiful depiction of this idea of seeing Today, the people that are gonna be baptized are saying, I I've been seen by Jesus. I now see him in a different way. And I am going to allow in front of all of these people a, a physical demonstration of what Jesus has done in my heart and what I am committing to seeing all the way through. So Pastor Mark's gonna lead us in this time and we're gonna celebrate these amazing people and all that God has done in their lives. If you are here today and you haven't had the opportunity to take this step of baptism, maybe you're here today and you haven't even had the opportunity to say yes to Jesus' love, but something in your heart is stirring and you're saying, I, I think he sees me. Know that he for sure sees you. And today is an amazing day to say yes to his love. And we can put you in the tank today. So after service, after service, you can come and see Pastor Mark. You don't need to leave here and wait and wonder or think about another time. You can do this today. But friends, while we know there's only one Jackie and Robert, I hope you are compelled. Yeah, absolutely. I hope you are compelled to not let a single Jackie and Robert sit alone under another fig tree when we can say, come and see. Come and see the one who sees you. So let's stand and we're gonna close today with this benediction that I had no idea Rob was gonna pray over sweet baby Luna today. But I can't think of a better way to end our service. So extend your hands and receive this blessing. May Christ dwell in your heart, CCF, through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and that to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Go in that assurance today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.